So I'm gonna start off this video with an apology, seeing as it's gonna bug a lot of people. Because we're talking about Tyranids and their bugs. <laughs> Hey! Today we're going to be doing a deep dive into the Tyranid faction competitively in 9th edition Warhammer 40k and covering the best lists and tactics that you can use to win that sweet, sweet biomass. Let's do it! What's up folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi and today we're going to be talking some Tyranids. So far, I've played dozens of competitive 9th edition games with Tyranids, and at this point, I consider the faction to be pretty much solved. Meaning that the most optimal lists and strategies have been basically sussed out for the current meta game, and unless the meta changes dramatically in the near future, I don't think we'll see much variety in the types of Tyranid lists that start doing well at large events. I also kind of consider this video to be a continuation of the series, including my other 9th edition Tyranid coverage videos. While I was making those videos, I was sort of developing my opinions on the fact and this one should be a sort of concise summary of a lot of the points that I brought up in those previous videos. So if you want to see the evolution of the list, you can check those ones out. Today, I'll be covering the strengths and weaknesses of the Tyranid faction in 9th edition 40k, the most well-rounded list that I think is appropriate for the 9th edition meta, including some talk about the best units and tactics. I'll go over a summary of some other good archetypes the Tyranids have access to. And lastly, I'll cover the faction's most useful combos of stratagems and abilities. I should note as well that I'm going to be coming at this video from the perspective of a 2,000 point competitive games of 40k in the GT 2020 format, although to be fair most of the information will still be relevant for other formats. I'm going to be talking largely about pure Tyranids as well, so I won't really be touching on Gene Stealer Cult or Forces of the Hive Mind style lists. So before we get into all that and talk about specifics about lists and tactics and secondary objectives and stuff like that, I'd like to cover the strengths and weaknesses of the faction holistically and how it's evolved from 8th edition. Back in 8th edition, I made a video summarizing the Tyranid faction. I meant it to be the first in a series of videos like that for all the factions in the game, but then 9th Ed got announced like a couple weeks later, and so it seemed like a total waste of time. But in that summary, I talked about Tyranids being easy to kill with relatively average shooting and melee damage output, a good psychic phase, and absolute uncontested domination of the movement phase with extreme threat ranges and movement buffs, lots of double moving and hit and run effect. And for the most part, that's all still true, but the game has shifted pretty heavily in the new edition to value those attributes very differently. In ninth edition, the focus on holding primary objectives has made resilience and the ability to stand in one place on the table without dying, basically the name of the game. But that also means that the enemy army is generally forced to move into the range of close range damage output units. Things like short range guns and psychic powers that top out around 18 inches. And as a pro tip, Tyranids do that short range game and psychic powers super duper well. It's also made threat range much less important since your army is basically forced to stand between 12 and 18 inches away from your opponent's army in order to complete the scenario anyway. So while Tyranid's ability to circumnavigate the planet be like six times every movement phase is still useful, it's less crucial than it was in 8th edition where if you couldn't get to grips with your opponent to begin with, you basically might as well not have ever had a fight phase. With all that in mind, we paint a very different picture of the Tyranid faction in 9th edition, with the strengths of the faction being an excellent movement phase that's especially good at completing maneuver-based secondary objectives and contesting enemy objectives with cheap objective-secured troops using double-move abilities like Hive Commander, Metabolic Overdrive, and Overrun. They also have a good psychic phase that, while it's not quite as dominating as factions like Eldari, Grey Knights, and Thousand Sons, it still has a suite of incredible support powers, some pretty decent mortal wound output, and access to excellent psychic defense in stratagems like Deepest Shadow and abilities like Shadow in the Warp. They also have a truly absurd shooting phase damage output, featuring some of the most powerful indirect fire in the entire game, with Hiveguard using the single-minded annihilation stratagem to create an oppressive rain of high-value artillery shots backed up by solid direct fire shooting using Exocrines buffed with High Fleet Kronos' of psychic power Symbiostorm. So that's right, folks. Tyranids are a gunline faction now. As for the weaknesses of the faction, 
The changes to the way melee works in 9th edition have sent Tyranids to the bottom of the barrel in terms of melee damage output. With all of their dedicated melee units outside maybe the Swarm Lord punching anemically below their weight class. The faction generally lacks resilience. Tyranids tend to rely on large units of 6 to 10 models, which makes them very susceptible to blast weapons, and even with the defensive buffs they can layer onto infantry, most of their frontline units don't sport better than a 4 plus armor save, meaning that even small arms fire like bolt guns puts a dent into them. Unlike the powerhouse Imperium factions that bring jack-of-all-trade units who compete in every single phase, Tyranids use highly specialized units that tend to excel in a single role. This tends to make the faction very inflexible at list construction and makes it difficult to build a well-rounded army. I'll note here as well that I don't think Tyranids are great at killing hordes of enemies, although this is more of a list-building restriction than a true weakness. Tyranids do have specialized units that can kill swaths of enemy models, but the faction's inflexibility that I just mentioned means that in order to build a list that can fight high model count armies, they'll need to drop some of the faction's best units out of their list, which will hurt their other matchups. From an overall power standpoint, I place Tyranids somewhere around the middle of the pack. Currently, they're very reliant on their ranged attacks to deal damage, and in most matchups that's fine, but if they're ever outshot or face an opponent that's resilient enough to withstand the shooting, they can be in trouble. Unfortunately, the big downside is that some of their worst matchups like Sororitas and Custodes come from the very top tier of the meta, so winning major events might still be a struggle for the faction, but the saving grace is that their Space Marine matchup isn't actually that bad. And since the damage profile of Exocrines and Hiveguard, some of their best units tend to match up fairly well against a lot of Marine units, they can actually outshoot a lot of Space Marine armies. So with that in mind, let's put all these pieces together and create the list. I mentioned before that I think Tyranids at this stage are basically solved, and as such, I think that the strongest list archetype has been discovered, which is mostly what I'll be talking about in this video. That's not to say other varieties of Tyranid list can't win, and there are some pretty okay ones. I'll talk about some other archetypes of Tyranid list that are doing pretty well towards the end of the video. But based on my experience playtesting a wide variety of Tyranid archetypes, if your goal is to win games with the faction, the style of list I'm about to cover is one I think you should be considering, largely because I think it has the greatest selection Collection of good matchups and a smaller swath of bad ones. Given how powerful shooting is in 9th edition, the core of the list should focus on your shooting base. That being around 10 to 12 Hive Guard in two units of either 5 or 6. Personally, I like 6 for the extra damage output, since units of 5 tend to like annoyingly leave 1 or 2 wounds left on units that they shoot at, but 5 also makes you immune to the blast keyword and makes coherency easier, so there are fine arguments for either size unit. Generally, you'll be able to find a place behind a line of sight blocker to put both units where they have range to most objectives on the table, and can slowly hammer your opponents to dust with heat-seeking snake missiles. Backing them up should be two to three exocrines. I found two to be the sweet spot in my games, but if you're in a meta without much line of sight blocking terrain, going the full three can help alpha strike your opponent super duper hard. With Hiveguard shooting beating the crap out of your opponent, they'll be incentivized to leave cover and advance at you, and Exocrines are the perfect unit for punishing them on that approach. The ability to shoot while in melee because of the monster keyword also means that you can use them to guard the flanks of your castle, and can still kill any light units that try to move up and engage the Hive Guard, which unfortunately for them would actually stop them from shooting. Regardless of the sub-faction the rest of your army is in, these units should be in a High Fleet Cronus detachment, alongside probably at least one Neurothrope to buff them with Symbiostorm. I generally also equip the Resonance Barb to the Neurothrope with Symbiostorm, just ensure it goes off, because in a lot of matchups, that power is the difference between victory and defeat, generating an enormous amount of extra damage, especially out of those Exocrine shots. The extra damage output and accuracy from Cronus makes it hands down the best sub-faction pick in 9th edition, and you should generally start with at least one Cronus detachment with the units as I just covered. If you're okay with spending the CP then you can put your gunless bugs in a separate sub-faction detachment. Given how important resilience is in 9th edition, I'd recommend Leviathan for the situational 6 plus damage ignoring, but there's also an argument to be made for Kraken, although I don't think the extra maneuverability that Kraken gives you is as important as it was in the past. A couple custom high fleets also come up here, as we'll talk about as I go through the rest of the list. There are going to be a lot of Scything Talons in your army, so having access to Biometallic Cysts for plus 1 AP on those is pretty useful. Also, we have a lot of multi-wound models, so Metamorphic Regrowth to regenerate wounds is also pretty good. So you can play around with some different sub-factions, but generally I would start with the Kronos Attachment and then build out from there. So with that Kronos Gunline squared away, we need a solid front line to help protect and support the castle. And also, obviously, sit on objectives and actually score primary points. I'd start with 18 warriors, probably two units of nine. Warriors are a bit of a weird unit since they come stocked with ranged weapons, but their shooting is 
absolutely worthless, and generally they'll want to be advancing and performing actions anyway, so definitely don't equip them with any guns. Just replace all of their weapons with basic scything talons. This keeps them super duper cheap and helps them kill lightly armored infantry in melee if you ever really need them to. I upgrade both units with enhanced resistance using progeny of the hive and dropping the warlord trait. This is way better if you're playing in a format with mutable pregame selections like the T5S2 format since in some matchups like most Necron lists or Eldari, Enhanced resistance is basically worthless, and spending those physiologies elsewhere is much better. But if you don't have that option, I'd definitely lock it in on the warriors to keep them around longer, since it's, it is useful in most matchups. The whole goal of these units is to take up real estate and set on objectives. Don't expect them to actually like deal much damage to your opponent or even survive too long, but they're super cheap and not easy to chew through, and should keep you live on the primary objective until your guns can whittle your opponent's army down to basically nothing. In that same detachment, the Swarmlord is an absolute necessity, I think, to, for Tyranids to compete competitively right now. He's an incredible support piece and deals massive damage both in the Psychic and Fight phases. In this list specifically, your opponent is going to be trying to break into the castle and having the Swarmlord there to anchor punish aggression with Smite plus Psychic Scream or potent melee attacks is pretty important. Hive Commander is also an extremely useful tool to keep Swarmlord himself active, either increasing his own threat range or moving him in and out of cover to cast Psychic Powers, or just to maneuver your basic obcept troops onto objectives. In rounds three to five, he becomes basically a guided missile and can move up the table very quickly to clear objectives by himself or finish off any enemy straggling units that are hiding behind cover. Lastly, we need some cheap models to perform random housekeeping tasks like screening out deep strikes and performing maneuver secondaries or performing actions, sitting on back objectives and stuff like that. I start with one to two lictors. I'm a complete convert to the cult of the lictor and i think one is basically required in every single list with two being preferable if you can fit both of them in with the way secondary objectives work in gt 2020 having deep striking infantry is incredibly important generally a lictor will pop in and score three to five points from deploy scramblers or repair teleport homers and then one to two additional points from engage in all fronts it's almost a direct purchase of like five to six victory points per 37 points spent which is an insane conversion they're also small enough that they can often sneak through screens on the back table edge and low priority enough that if they survive a full round and get to harass your opponent, they can kill things like rapier carriers, they can contest objectives. You should never underestimate the power of a single move nine model that's sitting in your opponent's deployment zone that can potentially double move with metabolic overdrive to get wherever it needs to. Definitely don't leave your lictors at home, kids. I also never leave home without between 30 and 50 infantry models, generally either Hormigants or Termigants. They're to contest objectives, they move block, they deep strike screen, they can perform actions and generally do random infantry things. Personally, I actually really like Hormigants. While Rippers or Trios of Warriors are sometimes a little bit more efficient in terms of points, the extra speed and board coverage in that infantry keyword are all very important. Hormigants having a base movement of eight also means that they have a much easier time getting into different table quarters or contesting objectives. But if you can fit additional termagants in, I would definitely consider dropping out some hormigants just for the extra bodies. All right, so there we have the list. And a competitive list composed of these archetypes is, I think, the direction that you'll want to go to be successful with Tyranids in 9th edition. With some minor alterations, of course, to take into account the different metagames, etc. And I'll talk about some alterations you can make to compensate for different matchups later in the video. Like I mentioned before, while there are some other competitive archetypes that the faction can bring to the table that are relatively successful, I do think that this is the most well-rounded version the Tyranids can bring. So with this in mind, I'll go over the specific list that I'm currently playing. I have a couple dozen games under my belt with this one specifically, and I don't really see a reason to change it beyond some very minor war gear swaps. That list is... Starting with a Leviathan Battalion, bringing in Swarmlord with Psychic Scream and Onslaught, a Neurothrope with Catalyst, as well as two units of nine Warriors, equipped all with Scything Talons and Enhanced Resistance, two units of ten Hormigants, as well as that one beautiful, gorgeous Lictor. That's followed up by a Kronos Patrol, led by a Neurothrope with Resonance Barb, ten more Hormigants, two Exocrines, and two units of six Hiveguard, with their trusty Impaler Cannons. Okay, so there's the list, but... How exactly does the list play? It's actually, I mean, it's really straightforward. It generally wants to castle the Hive Guard behind whatever line of sight blocking you have in your deployment zone and use the rest of the army to protect them 
pushing for objectives when it's safe to do so after your opponent has suffered crippling damage from a million heat-seeking laser snakes, including generous application of the single-minded annihilation stratagem. Unless your opponent can't reasonably threaten you on the top of one, the list deploys very defensively and uses Tyranid mobility to reach objectives whenever it's convenient for them. Ideally, the Hive Guard will have some nice buildings to hide behind, with Hormigants and Warriors screening out or bubble wrapping them in case of any cheeky threat range buffs that could get your opponent a charge on the top of turn one. The Exocrines can also help protect the flanks of the formation, since their ability to shoot while in melee makes them extremely dangerous to any harassing enemy units, especially alongside the potential of four smites that your characters can output into anything engaging your backline every turn. Overall, the ideal game state the list is aiming to achieve is removing threats that can take out the warriors, and using them in the late game of rounds 3 to 5 to control the center of the table and rack up a bunch of primary points. With that in mind, once battle is joined, it's important to look at the weapon profiles that your opponent has access to. Often, they'll be bringing some heavy weapons or powerful melee embedded in their list, like Smash Captains or Thunder Hammer equipped intercessor squads that can chew through your warriors with relative ease. If this is the case, it's important to use your Hormigants early to contest objectives while keeping the warriors safe, giving you a few extra turns for the artillery to whittle down those threats that could easily remove them. Otherwise, if your opponent is bringing a lot of middling damage weapons, especially stuff that's AP 1 or 2, that enhanced resistance can just tell to get stuffed, and that would have trouble killing the warriors, it's safe to lead with them to hold those objectives early and get those primary points as quickly as possible. Don't worry too much about hiding your warriors a little bit far from the front lines. I mean, you're playing Tyranid, so with a couple good advance rolls, you can potentially move those guys 24 inches plus a charge, or just straight up triple move them 18 inches plus 3d6 thanks to the combination of metabolic overdrive and hive commander and speaking of metabolic overdrive we'll have to talk about secondary objectives but not right now first we're going to cover the other pregame selections that are usually pretty good well i found that i usually play with similar psychic powers and relics each round if you're playing a real 40k format that's not pent by apes that allows you to change your pregame picks each round like uh, for example t5s2 you can join our free events in the discord link below or visit tts40k.com for more info you have some control over your adaptive physiologies which can make or break some matchups i guess here it's worth mentioning the tyranid warlord traits are generally garbage and you're better off just playing as if they don't exist. Almost always swap a Warlord trait for a free physiology, basically 100% of the time, in basically every list ever, and in this list, even more so. 90% of the time, you'll want enhanced resistance on your warriors to keep them sitting around on objectives for a little bit longer, but occasionally, your opponent comes armed with weapons that aren't sporting just AP 1 or 2, or just, I mean, just aren't that dangerous to your warriors. Necrons and Eldari, for example, both bring masses of scary AP 3 guns, so your piddly enhanced resistance has no power. In these cases, I'll generally swap for Dermic Symbiosis on the Exocrines, which helps keep them alive in that firefight a little bit longer. Additionally, in some matchups, especially against opposing artillery gun lines that can pose a threat to the Hive Guard, it's worth putting Enhanced Resistance or Dynamic Camouflage on them to keep them shooting a little bit longer. In terms of relics, you can basically lock in the Resonance Barb on one of the Neurothropes. A lot of people don't like this pick, and when Blood of Ball released, I actually was one of them. It's a weird include because the additional cast afforded by the relic can't be used by the Neurothrope without synaptic channeling, because Neurothropes, while the biggest brained boys, are too dumb to remember how to cast more than one psychic power other than Smite. But those people that don't like Resonance Barb and Neurothropes, they are wrong. Both Symbiostorm and Catalyst are crucial to the function of the faction, and guaranteeing they go off as often as possible is super duper important. And a Neurothrope equipped with the Resonance Barb is literally the most reliable psychic power a Tyranids can get. Since Neurothropes reroll their own once to cast naturally, only a roll of double twos will naturally fail a Warp Charge 6 psychic test. And even then, any roll that still fails, including a one, has a greater than two-thirds chance to reroll that one into a success. Even if you roll those two twos, you can just CP reroll it to get a whole nother try. It's crazy reliable. After all, I mean, let's be real, what else are you going to take? Some some spicy Yumgarl factor on your Neurothrope to pump up those melee stats? Go get them, boy! So what psychic powers are we buffing with that Resonance Barb? In most games, the powers on the Neurothropes are basically locked in. The Cronus one takes Symbiostorm because the damage buff to your ranged attacks is excellent, and usually wants to cast it on an Exocrine if it has a good shot at something important, because its natural plus one to hit modifier lets its attacks explode on fives instead of sixes. Although in a pinch, casting it on whatever Hiveguard unit is going to be annihilating stuff single-mindedly nets about the same number of attacks on average. 
Since Symbiostorm is often so important to maximizing the damage output of your guns, this is usually the Neurothrope I'll run the Resonance Barb on. However, this changes if you're up against an opponent running a lot of negative hit modifiers. Since these drastically reduce the effectiveness of the power, it doesn't even get to trigger on Hive Guard that are minus one to hit, and it only explodes on sixes on an Exocrine that's standing still. I'll talk about specific matchups later, but I'd swap the Barb to the Catalyst Neurothrope in these cases. I mentioned earlier that Catalyst is also super important to Tyranids in general, so the other Neurothrope gets that one. And lastly are the Swarmlord's powers. Now, no offense to Swarmlord, but his psychic powers are the least important since he doesn't get any buffs to cast. In the turns that he's not hive commandering stuff around the table, Swarmlord is actually a pretty good damage dealer in the psychic phase and can play a hit and run game with psychic powers. So I tend to run him with psychic scream so he can potentially be smiting twice before running away behind cover during the shooting phase. Only being warp charge five means that he can actually get smite and psychic scream off pretty reliably without any bonuses to cast. Poor Swarmlord, he's, he's the, the lord of the hive, but he's not actually that smart, so he only gets the spells that are really easy to cast. <laughs> I also find it useful to have Onslaught available in case either a warrior unit or Swarmlord himself needs to be able to advance and charge, so usually that's his third power. Having on Swarmlord also means that he doesn't have to stay in range of any Neurothropes to have them cast it on him, so he's actually a little bit more free in the late game. Honorable mention in this slot to the Horror as well. It's another power that works well with Swarmy's hit and run game plan, and in some matchups like Imperial Guard or Tau that don't have great access to rerolls, a hit penalty can be super duper useful. All right, so now we've talked about pregame army selections. Let's cover the big scary elephant in the ninth edition pregame phase. Secondary objectives. <laughs> now, in my opinion, Tyranids are not good at scoring secondary objectives. At least a gunline style list like this one that we're talking about now isn't generally good at scoring secondary objectives. And that's actually a good thing. That's absolutely how it should be. A list with a passive play style should be punished with a lower score in exchange for a little bit more safety and higher damage output. I do think Tyranids probably can build a list designed solely around maximizing esoteric maneuver secondaries and lists like Hordes or Gantt Carpets are pretty good at that. But in my experience, a list like that has a little bit more trouble winning all of its games. Turns out armies preoccupied with planting teleport homers and overdriving into every table quarter ever typically doesn't do as good a job at actually killing the enemy army and winds up with a lot of dead models by, you know, around two or three. Now this weakness in secondary objectives isn't a hard and fast rule, but generally I'll build my game plan around completing two maneuver style secondaries with the third being more of a flex pick. When in doubt, the two maneuver secondaries I almost always pick are deploy scramblers and engage on all fronts. Deploy Scramblers is an absolute no-brainer. The first two deployments are just trivial. You'll need one of your random warriors or Hormigant squads to slow down enough to drop a Scrambler in your deployment zone, usually on round one, and then one in the center of the table, usually on round two. In this case, a really super duper important interaction is the one between metabolic overdrive and performing actions, since overdrive triggers immediately after the unit moves, and neither of the moves that it gives you is required to be an advance. The unit, after performing the second move, is still eligible to perform actions. This makes it super easy to get units into position to do things like deploy scramblers and banners. For example, Hormigans can do it from 16 inches away, and that little lictor we have in the list can do it from up to 18. On round two, you'll usually have a unit in position to score engage in all fronts in one of your opponent's table quarters while also dropping a scrambler. And on round three, that little lictor sneaks into the corner of your opponent's deployment zone and deploys the last scrambler to complete that secondary for 10 VPs. Obviously, on this one, you'll never get the full 15 VPs, but it's basically impossible to fail to get those 10. Similarly, a gunline list will rarely score the full 15 VPs from engage in all fronts, but Judicious use of metabolic overdrive and some help from that lictor hiding in a corner or a swarm lord going totally face and double moving himself all over the table should get you 10 to 12 pretty regularly. For that last flex pick, if it's possible, I try for a kill focused secondary like bring it down or thin their ranks. The big downside being that at this stage, most players and especially the lists at the top of the meta are building to mitigate their VP bleed on these objectives. So it's not always possible to max them. Now, despite how alluring and shiny they may appear. I'd actually recommend steering very clear of Warpcraft secondaries. They're they're pretty bad. You can't abhor in the list because you have Psychers, and the Tyranid list kind of hinges on all three casters using all their powers every round, so giving up one of them for the entire game to try for Psychic Ritual or Mental Interrogation is a pretty big deal. I also recommend that you check out the video that I made a few weeks back talking about how to pick secondary objectives. In it, I list a couple of the mission-specific secondaries that are good substitutes and the situations in which some of the generic secondaries like Raise the Banners High and Domination are really good alternatives to the maneuver secondaries that I outlined earlier. 
One other thing I feel I should mention is that a benefit of the list is that it's actually very difficult to score secondary objectives off of. If you're running the build with two Exocrines, it only brings three monsters to the table, so bring it down is unmaxable, and, I mean, beyond that, it's also rare for both Exocrines and Swarmlord to go down in a single game anyway. Often, opponents will pick Abhor the Witch, seeing as it has three Psychers, but this is a giant trap, so recommend that they do that every game. And unless they're literally tabling you, in which case, they're probably going to win anyway, none of the Psychers should be in basically any danger. Sometimes, Swarmlord goes down in the late game when he commits in to blow some stuff up with his big swords, but the Neurothropes should essentially never die. To be honest, this whole style of list feels absolutely terrifying if you're someone who wants to rock up and play some good old-fashioned fair 40k by having armies shoot broadsides of cannon shells at each other like old-timey frigates, and maybe fighting with chainsaw swords sometime after round 3 in some exciting boarding actions. Rocking up with some good-intentioned, well-balanced imperial fun and getting the sky absolutely blotted out by 3 million intercontinental ballistic laser snakes unleashed by the space dinosaurs hiding behind one single wall on the other side of the table. It's gotta be a bit of a shock. It's actually kind of a new and exciting experience for Tyranids to have an effective skew list like this for once. <laughs> Now, as we move on, I'm going to mention some of the weaknesses that this style of list presents. Like I mentioned before, it doesn't do a great job of scoring secondaries, and most of the time you'll be getting 30-ish VPs off of yours, meaning that the list also doesn't win very big. Most of your wins will be in the high 70s, low 80s, but the elusive 100-0 is pretty rare, so be warned if that's something that's really important in the format you're playing. It also has some very specific bad matchups. The most glaring weakness is hordes, like orcs or demons. The high value of all the attacks in the list means that while you can probably pretty easily shoot 30 models to death a turn, it's not a very efficient trade for your artillery, and while it's not a, like a list like this cannot fight hordes, it's just a very uphill battle. This is one style of matchup where the warriors actually start putting in some serious work, especially against a lot of toughness 3 enemies like demonettes, throwing 36 attacks out at a time and rerolling ones while being relatively tanky enough to escape too many casualties on the swing back is actually really nice. Tyranids are also uniquely affected by negative hit modifiers because of their interaction with Symbiostorm, so lists that sport a lot of these can be problematic as well. As a sort of related aside, ironically, Tyranids in 9th edition are hilariously bad in the mirror matchup. Thanks to the weakness to hit modifiers and the fact that none of their weapon profiles really match up well into one another, they end up being comically terrible and actually killing other Tyranids. The relatively short range of the artillery often means that stuff like Hive Guard deploys out of range of each other, so in mirror matches, you a lot of times end up with a handful of Hive Guard and maybe some Exocrines hiding in opposite corners of the map and growling at each other after having squashed every other bug on the table. <laughs> The same goes for Adeptus Custodes, unfortunately. I mentioned earlier that Tyrants have a decent matchup into Marines, who are one of the meta's top dogs right now, but the same isn't true for the Emperor's Golden Boys. Hit modifiers from the Vexilla aside, the profiles of most Tyranid guns just don't tend to match up well against almost anything the Custodes have. To make matters worse, Shadow Keepers can make Exocrines wound any of their T6 stuff like bikes on 4s and Force 5s for Hive Guard when they're shooting at the Telamon, while Oramite and Adamantium removes all of the AP for Hive Guard against any Terminators. Turns out, an enhanced resistance effect to ignore two points of AP is in fact way scarier on a two plus save than it is on a four plus save like on Warriors. Lastly, anything that can actually break into the castle is problematic. This is another reason that I think Custodes are a little scary since they're so extremely resilient they can make the trek across the table without losing much to the terrifying laser snakes and they hit so hard once they get there that they can punch right through the hive guard if they want to. A list archetype like Flyer Spam kind of compounds these last two weaknesses, with a bunch of hit modifiers all over the place, and with the maneuverability to easily finagle shots into the Hive Guard to kill them before they get to shoot, that's another tough one as well. Now the upside is that Flyer Spam tends to be a little bit weaker on the 9th edition mission format, so you don't tend to see a list like that very often, and Custodies still have some weaknesses, especially against Mortal Wounds. Having four smites a turn is pretty good into them, and can give them a little bit of pause, so that's definitely a playable matchup. Now, with these bad matchups in mind, I'll cover some general swaps that you can make to counter whatever metagame you find yourself in. The first obstacle is hordes, and this is actually a pretty easy solve. 
Historically, Tyrants have had a pretty good matchup into hordes of enemies. Partially that was off the back of Gene Stealers just outputting a billion attacks a turn, but also with the help of Quad Devourer monsters, Tyrants have been pretty good at leaf blowing. I think Raveners are actually kind of a sleeper agent here. They output much better damage than Warriors with an extra base attack at double the threat range, so you can deploy them super conservatively and bullet them out to clear large infantry units basically wherever on the table you need, especially with the help of Swarmlord to Hive Commander them and move 20 four inches before charging. If you splash in some sexy sexy red terror action, they get close to a hundred percent conversion on their hit rolls, meaning that they sink 40 to 45 strength 4 wounds into whatever's dumb enough to get in their way. With a hive guard shot or two to set them up, you can fairly reliably dice up an entire orc boy mob and then overrun yourself to safety. Now I'm not sure I'd wholesale replace warriors with raveners, they definitely fulfill different niches in the list, but I'd certainly consider trading some of the guns to fit them in if you're staring down a metagame that's bringing 150 models. Now, let's also talk a little bit about Hive Tyrants. These guys' loadout flexibility makes them a silver bullet include to shore up a lot of random odd matchups. Unfortunately, it's at the cost of being absolutely hot garbage in the vast majority of games, especially against Space Marines, and occasionally they need a lot of support to help them go. In this case, adding a winged Hive Tyrant with Quad Devourers in place of an Exocrine or some Hive Guard will go a long way to helping clear infantry, especially since they have solid synergy with Symbiostorm generating so many attacks. Tyrants can also be subbed in to shore up some other matchups as well. They make another great platform for Resonance Barb, for example, to fire off some reliable smites, which is one of the best tools against the dreaded Custodes, and can help equip melee weapons with the potential of murderous size to warn off flyers that get too close in that matchup as well. Hive Tyrants are probably my favorite unit in all 40k, so it's depressing to me that their hyper-specialized skill set makes them basically unplayable trash in most competitive formats, where being a jack-of-all-trades trumps being very specialized. Also, it doesn't help that Space Marine Last Cannons just, like, killed him immediately, so that also sucks. Stupid Relic Contemptor Dreadnoughts, get the f so in conclusion, Hive Tyrants are definitely playable if you're trying to answer a specific matchup, but generally, I try to avoid them at 2,000 points if you can. If you have some extra room in the list and want some additional reliable casts or smites, especially to kill those scary, scary golden boys, you can also throw in some zone thropes. They're a little tougher to kill than warriors, and their damage output with psychic powers is obviously much better. Unfortunately, they don't have obsec, and you do get less of them, so I wouldn't replace warriors with them, but I think the two units complement each other pretty well. It's helpful when warriors can move up and body block off the zone thropes or engage the enemies, and zone thropes can just continually fire smites into them unhindered. I usually recommend units of five zone thropes to keep them unhindered by the new coherency rules, and as cool as it is to take like 15 or 18 zone thropes in one list, Unfortunately, their Warp Blast is just a normal smite, so it does get harder to cast the more you have, so I wouldn't generally take more than one unit. Now, obviously, there are a couple other archetypes of Tyranid lists besides the one that I've outlined in this video, and, I mean, a couple of them are pretty okay. I'll give the two major ones a brief summary here, although, in my opinion, these archetypes aren't quite as well-rounded as the one that I've outlined earlier, and have some worse matchups than the version I talked about in this video. The absolute darling of the Tyranid community is Nidzilla, basically a list that focuses on big monsters to stomp across the table and shoot and or stab your opponent to a miserable, untimely, gruesome death. This usually means a mix of Hive Tyrants and Carnifexes, as well as some of the weirder big bugs like Toxicrines or Acid Spray Tyranifexes, and often backs these up with big guns like Exocrines. This style of list presents a big skew of Toughness 7 wounds, and often also brings a lot of negative hit modifiers that can be a real pain in some matchups, especially with Carnifexes bringing Spore Sits along to be innately minus one to be hit. If your Carnifexes or Hive Tyrants are packing heavy Venom Cannons, it can also put a lot of pretty solid 3 damage shooting on the table that can hurt pretty hard. There are also a couple of solid high fleet picks for this archetype as well. Leviathan and Jormungandr are both good for the extra survivability, and some of the custom high fleet combos are also good. Like the combination of synaptic augmentation and morphic team use for hyper accurate shooting while advancing, or more generally useful metamorphic regrowth for a little bit of extra wounds, and prey sight for extra effectiveness in melee. Now, there's not a lot of nuance to this style of list. It generally plods across the table and hopes to shoot enough of its opponents to death to close out the game in melee. And while it's fun to play, unfortunately, Tyranid monsters are highly inefficient, and you'll find that they quickly get outclassed by most other unit types. 
Guns like HVCs are very effective in extreme volume, and that's hard to squeeze into a standard list with the point cost and low survivability of a model like a Carnifex. Trading resilient obsec bodies for monsters raises additional issues as well, as you'll find the list having trouble holding objectives against such units that can sneak in under the big hoofed boys and steal the objectives out from under them. Now, a more effective game plan, and one that's emblematic of those sneaky little obsec boys, is playing on a horde mode and just dropping 200 models on the table to run screaming onto objectives. Eric Lathuris just podiumed to Brisbane GT in Australia with a classic Gantt carpet style archetype with a splash of Gene Stealer cult. So, big congrats to him for taking third and repping forces of the hive mind pretty well. This style of list fields a critical mass of termagants and hormagants and just basically hopes your opponent can't kill them all. Between relatively efficient 5-point bodies with objective secured, a 6-plus invulnerable save thanks to adaptive exoskeleton, and stacking that with minus 1 to be hit from a Venomthrope or Malanthrope that the unit can chain back to on the table edge, these little guys can be relatively difficult to kill for their size and points cost. The biggest downside is that the gains themselves don't actually do any damage, so the key of the list is embedding untargetable damage dealers like Psykers or Old One-Eye or Broodlords into the swarm and using them to trade for your opponent's big scary units. And then using effects like Overrun to hit and run out of the formation to keep them untargetable. With the distinct lack of snipers in the metagame currently, these characters can actually put a lot of work out, assuming your opponent doesn't have melee threats necessary to hop over their intervening gants and just kill them with Thunderhammers. The other issue you'll run into with this type of list is that opponents who don't think twice about removing 200 Toughness 3 models from the table. While the metagame isn't quite as well tuned for this archetype right now, you catch a lot of opponents off guard with it. Even the gunline list I outlined at the top of the video will absolutely struggle against this list without some tweaks. Matchups with a critical mass of blast weaponry or frontline units like Orc Boys or Harlequin players that are tailor-made to scythe through a massive infantry are still going to be very problematic. And while you'll rack up a bunch of early game DPs, often these lists end up trading models for points without drastically reducing the size of your opponent's army, and tend to peter out in the later stages of the game. I should mention as well that while I think this list is superior to Nidzilla, it's also very difficult to play effectively and requires a lot of finesse to succeed with. Now before I wrap up the video, we've been going for ages already, I want to go over some general combos to keep in mind while you're using Tyranids. The faction has some really important synergies and really weird stratagems that are really crucial to keep in mind while you're playing, so I'm going to go over some of the top ones here. I've mentioned Metabolic Overdrive like 10,000 times in this video, and that's because it is probably the most important single stratagem for the whole faction. Getting to objectives to contest them is very, very important in 9th edition, and especially to stop your opponent from running away with that early VP lead, and obviously Overdrive is great from that. On top of that, I've already talked about the amazing interaction between Overdrive and Performing Actions, which further cements its place as a crucial strat in the Tyranid Arsenal when you're trying to grab those secondary objectives. For the same reason, definitely keep Overrun in mind during your games. While Tyranids are generally pretty bad at actually killing stuff in melee these days, it's still a useful tool to keep in the back of your head, especially if you're able to kill enemy units in your opponent's fight phase, maybe after giving them a nice little wrap with some Tyranid Warriors. And that often gives you the movement to grab objectives out from under them before immediately scoring them during your own command phase. It can also be extremely useful just to hit and run with powerful melee units like Swarmlord. Imagine that guy moving and double moving himself, potentially with advances on top of Onslaught, then trying charging into melee, killing what he needs to, and using Overrun to move to an objective into your opponent's table quarter behind cover. The flexibility of Overrun is incredibly powerful. Now, speaking of Swarmlord, I think it is generally a good idea to bank one CP for each fight phase that that guy gets into. I mean, that's true for basically every Tyranid monster, and that's for Voracious Appetite. I can't really overstate the importance of this stratagem to Tyranid melee monsters. Full rerolls, especially against targets that you'll need a three or four to wound against, is often the difference between wiping out a vehicle or a squad of marines or unlocking overrun so you can get back to safety or bounce between objectives and standing there like an idiot engaged with one space marine sergeant on one wound with a thunder hammer who gets to deal six damage and then stop you from overrunning away especially on models like high tyrants equipped with monstrous scything talons being able to reroll your own ones to hit from the scything talent ability then getting full rerolls on the voracious appetite skyrockets their damage output through the roof if they're equipped with murderous size, they're putting a lot of fairly reliable 4 damage AP4 weapons into their target, which is... I, I don't know what really survived that. 
And for those annoying situations like I just described where there's one intercessor left on one wound and they're just sitting there being annoying, 9th edition has opened up an actually really interesting application for the implant attack stratagem. The stratagem only requires that your target was wounded by the attack to trigger. In 8th edition, that meant that if they suffered an unsaved wound, but in 9th edition, the definition has been changed by the core rules to just require you to make a single successful wound roll. So in some situations, you can use implant attack to finish off a one wound unit, even if your unit bounced off their armor save. So it's way more useful than you think with the amount of AP zero weapons Tyranid infantry tend to carry around. It's a pretty corner case interaction, but one that I found to be very useful on more than one occasion. If you're running a Lictor in the list, which I mean, as I talked about before, you probably should be. They open up some interesting synergies as well. Definitely don't forget the surprise ambush stratagem for the rare situations that you like to charge with the Lictor. The turn it pops in instead of placing a homer. The rerollable 8-inch charge is pretty reasonably achievable, and if it can engage some important enemy guns or kill an artillery crew, it's often worth doing. Likewise, if your terrain is bad or you are horrifically outgunned for some reason, you can keep an important infantry unit like, for example, Hive Guard in a standard strategic reserve, then use the Pheromone Trail stratagem to bring them up wherever the Lictor is on the battlefield. That's pretty useful if you want to keep your important units safe from an alpha strike or want them to attack from an unexpected angle, especially with Onslaught to keep the guns shooting even after coming out of reserve. And speaking of symbiotic devastation, let's talk about some gun strats. Honestly, if you're playing Hive Guard and have some decent shots, i.e. they can hit high value targets that aren't being gimped by hit modifiers or powerful defensive stratagems, most of your CP during a game will probably want to go towards single-minded annihilation. Symbiotic devastation is also obviously super important to keep the exocrines moving and shooting. From round two onwards, you can usually find something for at least one of the two to shoot at and leave the others open to advance to better positions or use the strat to move and shoot. Also, don't forget about Pathogenic Slime. While in my opinion, it's not a very good strat, 2 CP that you have to declare at the start of the shooting phase for some reason for a couple extra points of damage is not a good trade. But if you're super duper need the extra DPS, it can be pretty useful, especially when targeting three wound infantry like Gravis Marines with an Exocrine. It's also important not to forget about your Hive Fleet specific strats. While they're usually very situational corner cases, using all the tools you have available to you is crucial for winning games of 40k. Special shout out to Deepest Shadow for being super sweet. Since most Tyranid lists should be running a Cronus attachment in 9th edition, it's probably one of the most commonly ones unlocked. High Fleet Leviathan is a good pick right now as well for added survivability, so occasionally the War on All Fronts stratagem can be a useful tool in the toolbox since Neurothropes fulfill the requirements to trigger it and can give your warriors a slight bump in melee. Honestly, not that big of a deal, but I do think it's worth mentioning for 1 CP. Lastly, I've talked about it for ages in 8th edition, and while it's much less relevant in 9th edition, if you do find yourselves stuck in the dusty racetrack of High Fleet Kraken, Opportunistic Advance is one of the most important stratagems to keep in mind for that High Fleet specifically. It's another tool in the toolbox to get your units onto objective and extend your threat range with units that can advance and charge, but also it's capable of projecting units to Basically light speed in combination with metabolic overdrive, since the opportunistic advance speed boost lasts until the end of your movement phase, meaning that it's still in place when you use metabolic overdrive. So your dreams of sending lowly termagants 36 inches in your movement phase before triple moving them another potential 12 inches with Hive Commander just to show off to your opponent can finally be realized. So with that, we've covered all the stratagems and I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this video. I do hope that it was informative and that there were some nuggets of handy insectoid wisdom hidden in the morass of words that I just disgorged onto YouTube. I should note before the end too that this is based on the 9th edition metagame as of September 2020. So as new codex is released and the metagame shifts, the recommended units and most efficient list might change a little bit. But right now, I'm pretty confident that the gunline I outlined in the video has the widest swath of decent matchups. Now on a bit of a more personal note, by way of an editorial, I'm actually pretty unhappy with the position of Tyranids at the moment. Not that they're like bad or anything, like I mentioned before, but the direction of the faction right now is oriented pretty dramatically towards extremes of damage output 
or unit spam, which is a far cry from the 8th edition archetype, which, while they were certainly less powerful, all things considered, tended towards mid-range, high finesse style lists that were very interesting to play. I do think that this is a symptom of the 9th edition mission format in general, rewarding basically a more straightforward playstyle. So we might actually never again see the kind of hit and run play that we did in 8th edition and especially in ITC. But I think it's also emblematic of some broken internal balance within the faction, with some units, especially units with big guns, being much more efficient than the more interesting hit and run melee units. So no happiness here. It's all sadness. Everything sucks. So anyway, I hope everybody enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider doing all that YouTube stuff and liking and subscribing, maybe commenting about how sweet Tyranids are. I'm sure you guys know the drill. You've heard it a million times. I also want to give a big shout out to my patrons for supporting me. Originally, this video was going to be a short one about my favorite tiered list. Then I ended up scripting almost 20 pages, and it took me way longer to finish than I expected. Long videos like this absolutely wouldn't be possible without the amazing patrons helping me out, so big, giant thanks to them for being sweet. They also got early access to this video and a special version just for them, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, if you want to help support the channel, you can join them at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise and also get early access to the DLC called My Undying Gratitude, which is also pretty cool. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Stay buggy, boys, and have happy wargaming. Ah.